Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. Um, if you have not figured it out by now, I am Romy Newman. I'm the co-founder of Fairy God Boss, and I am thrilled to be here with Nicole Huey. Nicole is a vice president and head of diversity and inclusion at SiriusXM and Pandora, and she's just a wonderful thought leader and expert in this space. Nicole, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So we're here today to talk about top diversity priorities for 2021. And we know we were saying that we've actually, this is, this is the biggest response we've ever seen to one of our webinars. So we know that this must be a very, very important topic. Um, it is always an important topic, but I think it is a even more high priority topic in the world than it has ever been. Um, so what we're going to do here, I'm gonna share some slides just to kind of tee us up talking about data and the events of the last 12 months that have kind of gotten us to where we are right now. Uh, and then with that context, I'm going to do some Q&A with Nicole, and then I'm gonna invite you to do Q&A with Nicole. Um, and I welcome you to drop Q&A along the way in the Q&A box, and we can try to answer along the way. Somebody says they can't hear anything. Is, can anybody else hear anything? If you can hear me, say so in the chat, please. Okay, yes, yes, we can hear. Okay, I guess I knew that because we were talking about, I should, I already knew. <laughs> okay, good. All right. Um, okay, so we're gonna set some context, but please feel free to use the Q&A function to drop questions in along the way and we'll try to take them. All right, here we go. So I'm gonna review some interesting data that was released over the last kind of 12 months, but it's interesting because it was just about a year ago that there was actually a report published that women had overtaken men as the majority of the US workforce. Um, and those of us who kind of spent a lot of time in this data thought, wow, this is a real tipping point. 2020 is gonna be the year. Um, but of course, 2020 turned out to be very different than we expected it to be. The year for different reasons. <laughs> it was the year, right. Um, the other kind of statistic that we at Fairy God Boss track pretty closely is out of the World Economic Forum. And what it said is that we are 200, over 250 years away from achieving gender equality in the workplace at the current pace of progress. So this is data um, that was released last December. This was their estimate as of last December, even before COVID. Um, and you know, this statistic I always find pretty dreary, <laughs> um, but I like to use it as kind of a, a rhetorical device, device because what I think to myself when I hear it is, wow, that's an impossibly long amount of time. But what would we have to change? What would we have to do differently to radically accelerate the pace of progress so that, okay, we probably won't see equality in my lifetime, but my daughter is seven. What would we have to do to see it in her lifetime? Um, so that's where we were at the end of last year. But then, as we all know, came COVID. And in March, the world shut down and the workplace shut down and schools shut down. And we had over 40% of workers working from home. We suddenly had a third of workers out of work. And then we had over half of school age children out of school. So we lost our childcare infrastructure. Uh, and this we know disproportionately affected women in the workplace. And then in May came the terrible murder of George Floyd and that on top of a number of other uh, incidents of racial injustice and the following protests led to a much greater conversation about racial injustice at work, which if there's a silver lining, I think that's it. Um, and we saw this conversation about race become primary, become first um, order in workplaces, which has been great. And we saw many com corporations make major statements, make pledges, but we also saw some skepticism that came with all of that uh, news and all of those announcements. Uh, and just to kind of, you know, as the summer went by, we saw more and more companies joining the ranks to either stand in support with the Black Lives Matter movement, or uh, so to make general kind of value statements, or then to potentially to make specific pledges of monetary investment, of hiring goals, um, in different kind of iterations and, and um, shapes and sizes. And then in October, the Bureau of Labor Statistics released new data 
that said that of the 1.1 million workers who left the workforce in August, September, 865,000 were women. And, uh, you know, if the quote out of uh, Rachel Thomas from LinkedIn, she said, if we had a panic button, we'd be hitting it. I mean, this is not, we were already 250 years away from just even further and further. And even worse, despite this enhanced conversation about race in the workplace, we see that all of these factors are disproportionately impacting women of color. We see women of color being more unemployed. We see women of color, unfortunately, this is so awful, but more, much more likely to have been directly impacted by the death of a loved one. Really terrible. And, and it's not done yet. We saw that, um, this is according to McKinsey, there's still 23% of, one, almost a quarter of women with ch children under 10 in the workplace, or, or under 10 in the home, are considering leaving their job now, still. And we see that women, and especially senior women, are feeling pressured to work more, more burned out, more exhausted. I mean, we see a lot of burnout and exhaustion across the board, but it's especially impacting women and senior women. So that's where we are now, that's the landscape. And Nicole, you are on the front lines here. Um, this is the landscape that you you joined SiriusXM Pandora in July. In and you yes. And you walked into this. So what I'd love to do now is ask you questions. I'm gonna ask you some questions and invite our audience to ask you questions about how you're reacting and how you're taking action in the face of all of this. Um, so to start, uh, we talked in the middle of this presentation about all the different pledges that are being made by companies. Can you talk a little bit about how SiriusXM Pandora has responded to the events of 2020 and what your commitments look like? Yeah, absolutely. Again, thank you so much, Romy, for having me. I am excited for about being the here. conversation and excited about all of those uh, that have decided to participate with us today. So thank you. You know, it's funny. You were going through all of the, the data and the slides that opened up. And I could not help but think that 2020 has been a year of incredible highs, right? Where you started saying there were more women in the workplace than men. And then these incredible lows. And so I feel like we've been on this roller coaster ride literally every day. And in fact, sometimes I feel as though the roller coaster changes in the middle of the day for me. So it's been, you know, a tough day. I jumped out of the kitchen, if you will, from one company doing this work and jumped into the Series XM uh, Pandora kitchen. Uh, and so the kitchen has been just as hot as it's been all over the place. And so for Sirius XM Pandora, we've done a lot of things this year. So, so there were some great things happening before I got to the organization, and we continued with those items as we went on. So one of the things I think that's really important for me to share is that we've been intentional, really intentional about listening to our employees, listening to our listeners, so those that tune in on across our uh, different brands, listening to the folks that create content for us, and listening to the brands, and ensuring with that intentionality that we are gathering the information necessary to make the right decisions. Sort of uh, an idea of our landscape. So we are absolutely We have business strategies and we have marketplace slash community. From a workforce perspective, we've created what we call pathways. This is one of my favorite things that we've done for the year because what we've said, again, very intentionally, is that we want to bring in graduates from HBCUs to fill some of our more uh, coveted entry-level full-time positions. And what makes this different than programs that I've been at or uh, helped administer at other companies is that we're letting the graduates decide where they want to start their career. And so we're saying, tell us about your goals, tell us about your aspirations, and let us help you determine where you want to start in the organization. So it's been a phenomenal opportunity to bring in some top talent from some HBCUs. So we're excited about that. That sounds incredible. It is, it is incredible. Again, one of my favorite things that we've done, uh, and we will expand that. You know, it started in 2020, where we will absolutely keep that going. Uh, moving forward. We, like most other companies, have continued to build alliances with other organizations uh, and uh, attended diversity recruiting events to keep influencing who comes to our organization. 
We've looked at our resume uh, masking process, and so we've instituted that. And here our goal is to really say to hire managers, look at the skills, look at the talents. Let's not let other things around the package that people come in really determine whether they should be here in the organization. So we're really excited about the resume masking that we're doing as well. When I think about retention and development, uh, we are partnering with some great organizations like McKinsey and Company and Management Leaders of Tomorrow to give our Black leaders an opportunity to continue to enhance some of the phenomenal skills that they already have. So this gives them more opportunity. We have a mentoring program that we launched as well specifically for underrepresented employees to help them with their career progression. We're always looking at talent. And so from a promotion perspective, from a stretch assignment perspective, we're looking at those as well to determine how do we get more women and people of color into those opportunities. I'm so excited to share for those of you that might not be aware that January 1st, 2021, we will have our first ever female CEO. Yay, Jennifer Witt. Yay Jennifer. We are so excited to have her. She is a, a successor to Jim Meyer, who announced his retirement early this year. And I can't tell you how many wonderful conversations we've had. And I'm so looking forward to working under her leadership. So that's been great as a place. So that's really the culture of the place, which is as important if not more important than getting people in the door, right? Because it does no good to get people in and the culture doesn't sustain them, like That's waste right. of energy. And I think all of my talent acquisition friends would say they work really hard to get talent in. They want everybody else to work just as hard to make sure that they stay. And so we worked on the culture piece. We've done some things that I think some might think are small, but I think are really, really big uh, in making sure that we think about inclusion in a really broad way. So all of our virtual all employee uh, meetings, we've instituted closed captioning to make sure we're inclusive or our hearing impaired uh, employees. We've made the usage of pronouns something that's widely accepted. And so we've asked employees if they choose to update their employee profile with their pronoun. And when you look them up in the directory, you will now see that. So if you look me up, it'll say Nicole Huey, she, her, hers. And so we're doing that to bring attention uh, to that uh, as well. And of course, it goes without saying our ERGs, hands down, we call them communities, have done a yeoman's task in making sure that people stay engaged on a lot of different fronts, right? They've tackled uh, census education, voter education, uh, and again, they continue to do great work. You had spoke a little bit earlier around companies giving money, and so we've done that as well, right? So we created a multi-million dollar fund where we will donate to organizations that are focused on social justice. Uh, and so we will continue to monitor that and do that as well. Uh, and then I can't say enough about our platform. One of the great things I love about being here is the fact that the platform in and of itself is about diversity, right? We have diversity of thought across music, across sports, across talk. Uh, and so we continue to leverage those relationships, leverage those platforms, to make sure that we're keeping the conversation about racial injustice top of mind. Uh, and so we will continue to operate on all of those different fronts as we move forward. Yeah, it's so interesting because as an employer, or as a company, you really have an outsized voice. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's important that we listen to those voices, all the millions of subscribers and listeners that we have and figure out a way to continue to connect with them. And that for me is really the foundation of diversity having dialogue, right? Yeah. Our dialogue is about listening to our customers and what they're telling us through their feedback, us figuring out what we're gonna do differently if we need to, to make sure we connect with them. And so it's a beautiful marriage in my opinion, right? The work at a company that has such a diversity platform, the reason why we are so successful. Yeah, and it makes me think uh, we're all so isolated right now, right? And so this, the idea of connectedness, creating these connections is more valued and important than ever. Absolutely, more important than ever, absolutely. And also because I feel like I've been doing a lot more housework than ever, having great things <laughs> to listen to has really absolutely. gone a long way. <laughs> absolutely, you know, before I joined us, being about two hours away commuting, about four hours a day, and Sirius XM became really my haven for getting me to and from home. Uh, and so as I think about it, really being a customer moving into a position to really support the direction of the organization has been phenomenal for me. So I get, thank you for all of those that uh, 
really are subscribers or listeners for us. We thank you. Yeah. Um, I was going to mention, actually, I saw data that came out of Pew. I didn't include it in the deck, but I probably should have. That um, So the average American commute before COVID commuted one hour each way, so a total of two hours a day. And almost all of that time has been repurposed into working more. So yeah. this idea that we're all feeling this burnout and the stress is really real. Um, oh, absolutely. And, and there's no, there are no boundaries, right? So before, when you went into the office, you could leave the office and that sort of necessitated the end of the day. Well, now there is no end because we're not moving, right? We're probably working harder despite what some might think and certainly longer hours than we would have if we had to leave the office to go home. Uh, so very, very interesting dynamics. Sure. We see somebody, somebody lives at work. We, yes, live <laughs> at work, live at work, yes, you right. both. It's all the same now, it's all the same. <laughs> so uh, we're coming out, we're, we're at a very interesting time for corporate diversity. And, and the topic of this webinar is about how we all should be setting our diversity priorities for 2021. Can you talk specifically about what are your top three priorities in this coming year? Sure, sure. So, so as I think about sort of what we have done, as well as I'm sure many companies, uh, we've done a lot of programmatic work. And so all of that is great and needed. What we're saying for 2021 is that we want to balance our programmatic work with our sustainable work. And so our efforts will lead us towards sustainability. So what sustainability means to me, uh, means to the organization, is that employees understand that they own it, right? It's not an HR a DNI initiative. It is an all employee has ownership and responsibility uh, in making sure that we are a diverse and inclusive environment. And so in that vein, how do we make sure employees understand their role? It doesn't matter what level you are in. Now, I will say that, but also say that leaders have an especially important role, but everybody has a role to play uh, in this work. And so we will take the year to really educate people on their role and then give them opportunities to check in, to be a part of the process, as opposed to sitting on the sideline of the process. Uh, and so we'll do that, really thinking about top down and, and uh, bottom up, and making sure that we're catching everyone. Education is absolutely hands down key for us for 2021. We'll spend a lot of the year, again, making sure people understand their role and giving them opportunities to check in. So a couple things we already have in the works that will start in 2021 that I would love to share with the group. Uh, and again, it's around education and giving people a chance to demonstrate uh, how they play a part. So we're doing this inclusive language project in which we will go department by department and ask employees to identify words that are not inclusive, words that might be stemmed in racism of some sort, just as an example, and then say, well, we've identified those words. Now what words can we use instead of? Words that would be more inclusive. So for example, whitelist, blacklist, right? So that those two terms could really be stemmed in white is good, uh, black is bad. And so we're saying there has to be another way. And so we're challenging people to come up with different words for inclusion. So that helps. We will talk about race. I, I mean, I don't know how any organization cannot talk about race. And in fact, if you think folks are not talking about race, they are. And so we're saying, let's own it. Folks are having conversations, folks want to have conversations, so what can we do to put some structure and some opportunity around that? So we are training all of our leaders to lead conversations around race for the organization. Meaningful, transparent, and authentic conversations, and we'll do that uh, as well. Uh, and then do a foundational training where everybody in the organization understands empathy, how to build empathy, and really how to build allyship at the end of the day. It's all about how do we support one another. So our education priority is huge for us for 2021. A couple other things around leader enablement is another priority for us. So we know employees look up at leaders to say what's important. And so with that said, what resources, what tools, what information do we provide to our leaders so that they can demonstrate their commitment uh, to diversity and inclusion? So we will work a lot with our leaders around that. And then one of my favorites, because I'm a storyteller, is defining our story. You know, as an organization with three brands, right, Sirius XM, Pandora, and now Stitcher, what's our combined story? What is it that we want to share about how important DNI is for us? What's our journey, where we're going with it? 
that is going to be critical for us. And so we have the inside story and the outside story. And my philosophy is there has to be congruency. At the point where people external to the organization can tell you more about your DNI than people internally, that's a problem. And so we're gonna make sure we craft both of those stories in a way they should be crafted that fits good for us, and then make sure the stories are congruent. Uh, so we'll spend a lot of time doing that as well for 2021. I love it. So it's education, it's getting leadership prior, prioritizing it and enabled, right. and then the storytelling. And really what I, what I love about all these things is you're equipping everyone with the how, mm -hmm. you're creating accountability, and essentially what you're doing, you're making, you're making diversity and inclusion everyone's job. Everyone's job. That's the only way to success is to make it everyone's job. And, you know, when we say that, we can't just say it. We have to give people things to do. I'm a big component of giving people things to do. And all of these things will tie in employees and giving them opportunities to weigh in, to, to add feedback and to add value to the process. Yeah, and I love the example about the, the uh, language because it's a very specific, Absolutely. tangible, and immediate assignment. I mean, it's, it, it's, in, it's talking about the way we all work every day. And they have ownership of it. So what yeah. is it for you? Like, I could say things that I think the company needs to do, but when you get people involved, they own it when they can do it for their own self. And so I, I love that uh, opportunity, and we're excited about what's going to come from that. Fantastic. So those are three big goals. How will you measure? How will you establish the metrics and, and pr progress? So that's a really interesting question. So, so when I think about goals, it's in art and a science, right? There is no, I think, one way to, to really manage goals for us. It really is balancing sort of that quantitative and the qualitative approach to setting goals. And so I think it all varies. I also believe that sometimes people underestimate the importance of qualitative goals. And for me, sometimes those have told bigger stories, more impactful stories than the data. Uh, and so we will set goals that really work for us. So from an overarching perspective, we have, I call them overarching goals for a lack of a better term, where we want everybody to be thinking about how they should implement DNI. What we also do, though, is say there are things that each individual group can be doing, and we want it to sit at that level. What are the goals that you want to do individually based on your own data? Let the metrics shape for you what it is that you want to do. So here are the overarching goals that we want everybody to think about and craft specific goals tied to that. We talked about one of them already, all employees own DNI. So whatever it is you can do within your group, for that, that's what we're asking people to do, and we'll work with them to shape that a little bit. The other thing really is around leadership, and leadership from an inclusive perspective. It has to be embedded, embedded in the culture, and it has to be evident every single day. So again, what can your leaders do in your independent areas to really demonstrate inclusive leadership? We also talk about representation. Now that has to be a goal on everybody's list, right? Because until we have parity for women and people of color, it's always gonna be a goal. And so we have those goals as well. Again, there are things we can look at across the company, but there are some departments that don't have the same challenges as others. So we're saying look within your area and let's talk about the goals that make most sense uh, for you. And then we also say that everything, DNI has to be embedded in everything, right? So how you think about your people, how you think about the culture you set for your area, not to mention the culture for the organization. And then from a business perspective, how are you tying in a diversity and inclusion for that as well? Uh, so, you know, from a representation, I'll give that as one really specific. While we're not setting a target across the company, again, we're having each group think about it from their own perspective. But this is what we're asking them to do in order to meet whatever that number is, whatever that goal is for them. Continue to build your pipeline of alliances and partnerships. Diverse talent is out there. And we will get to that diverse talent as we yes. continue to build alliances, right? Look at our ERGs, a great resource for talent. Everybody has a network. Everybody knows another great talent somewhere. So look at ERGs. Again, we call them communities and figure out how we can tap into them uh, as well. And then development, promotions, always think about that as well and keep that top of mind for everything that you need to do. 
Uh, and so we will continue to look at goals, again, overarching for the organization, but work department by department to figure out what makes sense for them. That's how you get buy-in. It makes sense for them and not something that's necessarily dictated across without any you know, consideration for what each department might be going through. Fantastic. Um, how do you, speaking of, so how do you recommend getting buy-in across functional buy-in? What are you doing to be an ambassador? So, you know, that's a great question. And, and I often say that leadership buy-in is critical. I, I mentioned earlier that employees look up to leaders to see what's important. And so we have to start there and we have to make sure that leaders are included. So I'll tell you a couple of things I've done. It, it may work for others, but it has worked for me. And so I, I'm more than happy to share that. So a couple of things. One thing is really building relationships with leaders. It is so important that leaders feel as though they can trust you, that they can have honest conversation with you and not feel judged. So I've had some really uh, powerful relationships with some leaders where they've said some things to me that others might have cringed at, but not me, because we've built a relationship where I said, listen, I'm here to be the sounding board for you. So I'm here to help you not to judge you. So tell me what you're thinking and let's figure it out together. And so building that relationship is key to getting buy-in. Really having the leaders understand that you understand the business. So we often say in this space that we don't want DNI to sort of be the afterthought. And so what we have to do, and what, what's worked for me is to think about how to embed DNI into the business strategy. So talk to them about the business and the impact of the business leveraging a DNI lens. And that gets those that don't want to hear the story. They're like, oh, that soft stuff. That gets them really embedded in the conversation. So doing more of that, uh, I think, has been important as well. Helping them tell their story. Everybody has a DNI story. And I tell my leaders that all the time. Being a white man does not get you out of having a DNI story. And so we spend time talking about that story. What is it? What was it for you? And then how do you take that story and, and be able to translate it for others to understand it? I love it. Critical. Yeah, yeah. Critical and that story piece. And they have to share it, right? It's, it's about being vulnerable. And so really helping them be vulnerable enough to share their story about uh, their DNI, not only for them individually, but then be able to translate that into why it's important for the team and then why it's important for the organization. Uh, and so really getting an opportunity to, to get in really good with these leaders is important. But I say don't force it, right? Not every leader is going to be on the same page. Not every leader will wanna have this conversation and that's fine. I'm the type of person that says, take people for wherever they are. And so I will leverage those leaders that are in, that believe it, that have demonstrated their commitment, and I will leverage their story. And this is a little secret of mine. I like competition. So I'll tell leaders all the time, oh, you should hear what so-and-so is doing. They're doing this really cool thing, something that you might want to learn. So competition is important, and they love to compete. And so I will tell them all the wonderful things that other leaders are doing to get them to get excited about what they can do uh, for their own uh, uh, department as well. Uh, and so it's about leaders understanding that DNI will help them in their job. We are selfish creatures by nature. So anytime you can say to somebody, this is going to help you because they love it. And so that's what I try to do. You have a team of 12. You have two people on your team that are go-to performers. Hands down, you can count on them for anything. How much better would it be to have a go-to team of 10 out of your 12? And so for you, leader, Mr. or Mrs. Leader, this is what you can do to help yourself. Uh, and so those are always work as well. Just a couple yeah. things that really get to um, what people want to do for themselves and make themselves look good. I'll take it anyway. I get it. Nicole, I think you're a salesperson. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in another life, in another life. <laughs> All right, I actually want to just throw in some questions we're getting. We're getting a lot of questions from the audience. I want to make sure we, we get them. And one of them is specifically about this. You talked, touched on this a little bit. What do you do if you, uh, you feel like your exec team's made up of all white men and women, mostly white men and women, and the reason that they're not talking about diversity or inclusion is because they don't want to say the wrong thing. You, they, this person said they can see it's mostly fear and nerves. How do you help address that specific issue? Yeah, that's a great question, and you're right. Most people want to do what's right 
They just don't know how or they're fearful. And so you just put it, I put it on the table, right? And I share my own mistakes. Listen, yes, I'm a black woman. Yes, I do this work, but I make mistakes too. And so I use my own mistakes so that people see for examples that we all are vulnerable to making mistakes. Yeah. We all could say the wrong thing, but it's not about stopping at saying the wrong thing. It's about how you recover. Okay. Uh, and so I lead with vulnerability so that they understand that they can be vulnerable too. Brene Brown. <laughs> uh, yes, yes. I think like making a, making a safe space, right? Um, great. So uh, before you were a DNI leader, you were in talent acquisition. So um, can you talk a little bit about now how can you, and do you, we talked a little bit about this, but how do you collaborate with the talent acquisition group to help drive diversity in the hiring yeah. uh, function? So yes, I definitely was in talent acquisition leading the college recruiting function for a previous uh, employer. And the talent acquisition and the diversity and inclusion partnership, I think is one that's so important. Uh, you know, in fact, when I was interviewing for this job at Sirius X in Pandora, the head of talent was a part of my interview panel. And so we had a great conversation around how do we collaborate as we move forward. I was able, because of my experience, to shed light and to understand some of the challenges that they have, where everybody expects talent acquisition to come to the table with all of the diverse talent, as though we can just shake some trees, right, and have diverse talent falling out. And so we had good conversation about not doing it alone and ensuring that each one of us understood that we had a role to play and how we could be supportive of one another. So, you know, one of the things that we've done and that I've done in other um, past uh, roles is look at the recruiting data. So I think that's a great way to partner the data. What is the data telling us? A lot of times we'll hear hiring managers say, I can't find diverse talent, they're not out there. Well, that's simply not the case in most cases. Simply right. not. That's a big one, yeah. It's a big one. The challenge is we can't always rebut that particular statement if we haven't looked at the data to know where people are falling out. So if we can go back and say, in fact, you know, 50% of the folks that apply to our open positions are diverse, that helps negate that particular statement. And here's where they're falling out. They're falling out, as an example, when they get to the hiring manager. So that's another level of assessment. And it allows you to create the strategies that will be helpful specifically and not sort of generically around that. So the data is really important. And I think say doing that in partnership, I think is important. We, from a DNI perspective, uh, have knowledge about a lot of organizations, just as TA does as well. And so how do we bring that to the table? How do we share? Here are some organizations that are good at X. Here are some organizations that can give us Y. And so let us help create the connection, introduce you to, and let us help you cultivate those relationships. So I think that's another big piece that we can do too as we you know, partner together. And just like we talk about leader enablement, I'm a big fan of talent acquisition enablement. So talent acquisition, those are the folks that are on the front lines and having the conversations with candidates. So are we confident, right, that talent acquisition can tell the DNI story? I talk a lot about the story. I wanna make sure that talent acquisition can tell the DNI story as we want it to be shaped uh, and shared with candidates, that they can answer questions, and that they can work with hiring managers to have that DNI cons uh, consultation or DNI conversation when an open position is there. So supporting talent acquisition, all of the recruiters, I think is another big way to help with that collaboration and get the best talent in the door. And then I said this earlier, I think the biggest thing that we can do is to make sure that the culture is right. Again, a lot of energy, a lot of money being spent from the recruiter perspective. They are doing hands down phenomenal jobs. We blow it if we don't create the environment where people want to come and stay. And so I think that's probably the biggest thing that we can do in collaboration. Absolutely, 100%. Um, Rocky asked, we know that diversity recruitment is a key component to the overall diversity strategy. In this year, where for many companies, jobs have been eliminated, eliminated at scale, how do you think diversity recruitment has been impacted? And what do organizations need to do to recover? So I think I, also a great question. I, absolutely, it's been impacted because a lot of the recruitment traditionally 
has been our, around events, right? So we go to events, we go to recruiting events, and we're live and we're meeting people. Now that's not happening. Everything is virtual. So it has a very different flavor uh, than it had before. Uh, people might be afraid to leave jobs. So the talent from that perspective may not be as visible because people are locking in and sitting tight because they don't know what's going to happen, right, over time. Uh, and so that could be impacting uh, to where we go. I always say that diversity recruiting, particularly building relationships with organizations is a long game. And so we can't get sidetracked by the side game of 2020 of things not being exactly where we need it to be. We still should be building relationships as we did despite the pandemic. It takes a while, relationships take time. And so we can't fall on the job. We might have to think about how to do it a little bit differently, perhaps than we did before, but it has to be top of mind and it has to be intentional. So forcing ourselves to continue to build relationships where they make sense, forcing our leaders, and I'm using forcing very loosely, forcing our leaders. With your fabulous uh, sales skills, yes, yes, forcing. Very, very loosely, very loosely, um, but really encouraging leaders to think about that they play a role in the, at a point that again, we take this concept of all employees own DNI, all employees can support recruiting. Recruiting is always happening. Whether there's an event happening, whether we have a partnership, recruiting is happening, right? right. So always, you're always, always recruiting, no matter what you're doing. And especially when you've got a big consumer brand like yours. Absolutely, always the, the, you know, the programming that we put, put out, that's recruiting. You know, the social media accounts that we have, that's recruiting. Everything is recruiting. And so it doesn't stop, just may look a little bit different, but we can't take our foot off the gas. We have to keep going because things will open up and we want to be prepared for all of that great talent. That will yeah, come. And, and consider it as a time to rebuild too, right? Absolutely. I mean, if you're doing mass rehiring, what a better time to think Absolutely. about starting with the diverse foundation. Absolutely. So, you know, so you, you said something that made me think, with the, the mass hiring. So one of the things I think that happens is that we assume that talent would just come our way, right? Most organizations are yes. fabulous organizations. And we say, because we all love our organizations, people would love to come work for us. That might be true. But what also is true that we can't take our foot off the gas. We have to always be thinking about our image, what we're doing, how we're partnering, uh, because we want people to remember when they're ready and not then try to, you know, jumpstart all of our efforts again when things open up. Right. We did have a specific question about the resume masking um, that you mentioned. So I wanted to raise it. Somebody asked, um, do you have logistical challenges while using an ATS? How do, you, how do you do this within your current capabilities and your software and are there any best practices? Yeah, so great question again. So we were actually doing it when we started it manually. So we had employees uh, from the talent team actually going through and masking information on the resumes. Uh, we are now working through, going through the process of working through our ATS because they do have that capability. I believe they do it manually as well, but at least we can offload that from our own people, you know, and have the, the ATS partner do that for us. Uh, and so, uh, it's important that people understand the elements that you're masking. And so there are different levels, different ways, different things that you can mask. So having people understand what those things are and being um, consistent with it, right? So that's the other important thing, to make sure that every role, even if it's an HR role, that HR roles are masked, right? So we think we don't have to worry about that. We don't have biases that will feed in. Everybody has to be masked. So it's the consistency with the process that will get you the results. So we just started, so we don't know all of the, the data to support what's happening at this point, um, but I'm looking forward to getting it because I think it will be powerful. Not the only thing that we should do, but certainly can give us some information to suggest do more of or do other things. So. Yeah, and I, and I love that you're, you're pretty ahead of the curve here and what can you help the rest of us learn too? Somebody else asked, Chris asked, um, how do you feel about slating goals within the interview process? Yeah. So my current company, we do not slate, um, but I've been at two other companies that did do slates. So I, I, have an, uh, I have an opinion on slate. So I think slating can be wonderful where you can say, and it depends on your organization, 
for every opening, we must have a woman or a person of color or both, right, and both on the slate. At the end of the day, if you continue to have exceptions to when, the, then it doesn't matter, right? Because now you've created a process, but you've also created this back door that people will use if they can. So for me, if we do slates, then we have to have very little exceptions. Now, the realist in me says we will always have exceptions. The point is that you can't have a lot of exceptions or you've just created a dual process. Uh, and so I think slates work. I think though, you can't have a back door where there are a lot of exceptions to the rule. Like you just, you know, have to do one, do it one way or the You have to enforce. You, ha you have to, <laughs> you really have to. Great. Um, and also we had another specific question about your HBCUs program. Mm -hmm. um, somebody's working on something similar and wondering if you could share any of the hurdles or challenges you face getting it off the ground. Yeah. So we haven't had that many hurdles because what we did very intentionally is we made sure we started with those HBCUs where we had solid relationships. And this goes back to the relationship piece again, right? So anytime you know, we go to an organization, our HBCU partners, and we're telling them about this wonderful opportunity, we're really talking to them with the foundation of that relationship that we built. So what things have we already done with those schools? That's important. Um, what things do we intend to do? So we've had those conversations at, as well, but it was grounded in a relationship. A lot of the HBCUs, particularly now, and I don't suggest to speak on behalf of HBCUs, but just like a DNI practitioner, it's a hot market right now, right? For students from HBCUs. And so now these schools, in, in our experience, have been asking a lot of really tough questions. Not only, okay, you're coming to us now with this opportunity, what else are you gonna do, right? And so now we're playing those kind of conversations. And so you got to be prepared to talk about short term and long term and leverage relationships that you already have. Uh, and so we've been able to do that. So we started small uh, and we will grow that. But we had to start with those that we have relationships with first. Great. Um, I wanted to ask, you know, we saw that we we're in this moment of crisis. Women exiting the workplace, mm -hmm. workforce en masse, women of color exiting the workforce en masse. What would you advise are the things that companies can do to keep women and women of color at this very vulnerable moment? So, you know, that's an interesting question because I think some of the things that people can do now are things that hopefully people were doing and it shouldn't matter whether we're in crisis or not. But it really is around listening, right? I started off saying that we've been really intentional about yes. listening. Listening is important. What are your women saying? You know, what are women of color saying about their uh, opportunities, their plight sometimes? We saw you shared the data earlier around women of color having to manage sometimes more things than others. So having an opportunity to listen to what women are saying is really where you get the specificity of what will work for your organization versus sort of these overarching goals that everybody says will work. Listen to what people have to say. So I think that's important. Over-communicating. You know, as a woman uh, in an organization, I want to feel safe. I want to feel like I can trust the words that are coming out of the mouth of whoever is sending it. The that email. trust or is so them. important. Yes, it's critical, right? And so, the more information I get, the more I can say, "Okay, it's making sense to me now, and now I trust it." So, over communicating, I think, is another thing, and we've done that really well in talking about what resources are available to women. Uh, and I think that's important, always reminding people, right? And so we have uh, benefits, obviously, right? Your mental health benefits, your uh, uh, time off, that's important. Uh, so whatever you can do to remind women of what is available for them, I think is going to be helpful. And just thinking about flexibility a little bit different. Uh, so many of the companies I've worked at, you know, we talk about flexible working hours and what that means or what that meant was you can start work at six o'clock, seven o'clock, or eight o'clock, and then go to the appropriate eight hour, you know, nine hours after that. That doesn't work anymore, right? We're all at home. So that six o'clock, seven o'clock, eight o'clock thing probably won't work. In fact, I probably need flexibility that might look something like I can start work at five o'clock in the morning, work until seven, and then I have to get my children ready to do their schooling. So I'm gonna need seven to nine to get them ready. And then I can come back on at nine and maybe go until one. And then I need to break again because I need to. So flexibility is critical. 
and how an organization can demonstrate that flexibility, what's important to uh, the women, what will also ensure that the goals are met because everybody wants to make sure they meet their goals. So we're not suggesting, you know, um, taking the, the goals and taking the expectations lower for the sake of lower right. because everybody wants to meet those. Right. Making sure that it makes sense, right? That they can do it in something that makes sense. So I think that's important uh, as well. And I think the world hopefully is finally recognizing that we all can accomplish the same amount in different approaches, different time frames, different different flavors. locations. Absolutely, yeah. diversity, yeah. right? It's all yeah, about imagine, diversity. yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. So I think you know those things are important. I'm really talking about gender bias because it's real, and you know being honest about that. You know when we're all looking into one another's homes and we're seeing all of this stuff around us. You know, we might see children that pop their head in, you know, while we're on calls, really being honest about the bias that comes with that and asking people to own it and to think differently about that. I think that's going to be important as well. And then, again, using your ERGs, phenomenal. ERGs are wonderful yeah, in creating opportunities for connection. And, and especially uh, now, especially, especially that we're all now. dispersed. Especially now. Our communities, hands down, have done a yeoman's task. Connections, education. Um, you know, yoga sessions, and who would have thunk it, right? Yoga over Zoom. But all kind of creative things are happening. And our ERGs are, are really putting their heads in the game around creativity. And I think we can leverage them more to help women stay connected. Yeah, great. Um, I'm going to turn to questions from the audience because there are so many. Um, there are a few that are kind of around the same theme. And you touched on it a little earlier. Uh, how do you handle the employees that are not bought into diversity, that are not uh, committed or don't, don't agree or don't want to participate? What do you do about that? You know, so that's a tough one. Again, you know, I said earlier that you meet people where they are and you're not going to get everybody. And I think that's okay, right? Because it's a journey and it'll take time to get there. So you leverage the ones that are bought in and then you leverage them to talk to some others. So people will expect me as a DNI lead uh, and for all of us, those all of us that are DNI practitioners, to say what we're supposed to say, right? That's what we get paid to do. But when you have employees talk to one another in a language that perhaps we can't, then that's when you perhaps can get people to start buying in. But I would never look for 100% buy-in because I don't think it's realistic. I think what we get can get people to buy into is that the workplace is one where our expectations are this. And so whether they buy into, into it from the heart or the head, I, I don't pretend to think that everybody will. Yeah. I do think that we have some things in place that make sure that we stay aligned and that we leverage one another to tell the story and people will buy in eventually, or they'll decide that it's not an organization for them. That's and right. so turnover sometimes can be good, right? right? And so, you know, for me, it, it is what it is. And you right. If you close, it, yes. yes. If you make that bind so close to the, the yeah. core DNA and of the organization, it, it will, there will be self-selection, right? Absolutely. Self-selection. And that's where, you know, you, you, you will take the people that want to fall out. You will take the fact that they're leaving and be okay with that. Right. Because now you can just replace them with people that have your uh, brand, that understand what you stand for coming into the organization. Uh, and so meet people where they are, take it for what it is, and leverage the ones that want to do the work. Great. Another question from someone who is working on the inaugural DE&I efforts. How do you get it started? How do you get this off the ground to begin with? Oh, great question. I, I think when I first started my career, uh, in D and I, uh, it was new for the organization that I was with uh, at the time. And so a lot of conversations. This is where a leadership commitment is key. Like the underground efforts to do it, D and I, particularly if you're trying to do it from a large perspective, just don't work. You've got to have leadership commitment and, and at the top of the house, really talk about how important this is. And then again, give them the tools and the resources to demonstrate that commitment in a very clear and a very loud way. But we started with small things, like we started with engagement. So engagement of employees around this topic, I think are easy things to do, one, um, because a lot of them are event driven. So you can create some events that really 
tug at people wanting to know more. Uh, and so starting some kind of engagement around DNI is a great thing that you can do uh, to help get people excited. Building the story around why it's important, I think also uh, is a critical thing in getting started. Um, but really, I, I think most importantly is understanding what you can do, understanding what the appetite is of the organization. Those of us starting this have big plans because as DNI leaders, we have vision, right? We have visions of taking our organization far, 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 far. We have to pace ourselves. And so I would say, think about those things that are critical and that you can get done. I'm about small wins. Like you just have to have some small wins. So go after those things. Achievable that, goals, yeah. like any project, right? Like any project, because you want people to say, yes, that worked. Now what else can I do? So use the metrics that you have in the organization uh, and let those drive and give you some smaller goals to start with before you start tackling those bigger things. There'll be plenty of big things to tackle. Go for the things that will give you some immediate wins. Great. Question about the ERG communities that you have. And somebody asked, what is an ERG employee resource group? Um, so how are they funded and supported from a corporate perspective? And how are they structured to thrive and not fizzle out? Yeah. Great question. So we call our ERGs, ERG is the, the umbrella term, we call them communities. Uh, and so we have several communities that represent us in the organization, and they are funded and structured under diversity and inclusion. And that's typically where ERGs sit under the auspices of the diversity and inclusion office. Ours does as well. They're funded through us. So in my budget, we include funds for these communities. But we also have executive sponsors for each of these communities. And your executive sponsors can do more than uh, talk to the ERGs, make sure that they are operating and the boundaries of how the organization, how the business wants to run. Some of them love to put in money. And so that's another way these ERGs can be funded, uh, tapping into the executive sponsors that support uh, those uh, communities or, or those ERGs. Uh, but not letting it stay just there, the way to really, I think, make ERGs sustainable and not make them fizzle is to make sure that they are connected and tied to not only the things that uh, support employee engagement, but to real critical business issues. Because you want the spotlight to be on these ERGs. You want everybody in the organization, not just the ones that are participants, to understand the value of the ERGs. And so finding opportunities for them to get involved in bigger projects uh, company-wide projects will be critical in helping them tell the, the story. Um, but you have to tell the story uh, and, and make sure that folks get the broadness of it, not only for the members, but again, for the entire uh, organization. Uh, and so start with ones that, you know, are critical to your business and then grow. There are some companies that they have tons of ERGs. There are some that have a few ERGs based on priorities for the organization. It runs the gamut. And so organizations should do what works for them, but they need some structure. And that structure for me is really grounded in ensuring that they are tied to the strategy and that their efforts support the strategy, which supports the business strategy and it goes up and up and up from there. Great. All right, there are many good questions. I'm not gonna be able to get to them all, but I'm gonna ask the last one. And then I'm also, just so you know, um, Nicole has graciously offered that if you have follow-up questions for her, you can reach out to her on LinkedIn. And you can also, um, when you do, she asks that you say, oh, I saw you on the Fairy God Boss webinar, so she knows uh, where you came from. Uh, but uh, I'll ask you this last question. So it's about the diversity-focused mentoring program you created. How does it work? Who are the mentors? And how do you prevent non-diverse employees from feeling excluded? Yeah. So... Our, our particular program, again, is not exclusive to uh, underrepresented employees. There's a focus on it. And so that's sort of where the difference, right? Mentorship is important for everybody, hands down. Um, what we know, though, is that from an underrepresented population, sometimes having a mentor makes the difference between people's progression um, you know, in an organization. And so while it is open and will be open for all employees, the, the focus right now is on our underrepresented population. Uh, and so when we talk about it, you know, we, again, we are careful to say that mentorship is great for everyone, but today the focus is on this. And then also share with them that there will be opportunities to grow and expand uh, this program. 
our mentors right now, depending based on where we want to go, are senior leaders in the organization, right? And, and it, it runs the gamut. I don't really buy into just senior leadership can be good mentors. Peer-to-peer -peer mentorship is great too. Um, but again, let the metrics determine how you want to focus your mentorship program. So for us, having opportunities for women and people of color to get to higher levels in the organization is important. And so we have senior leaders that are serving as mentors because that gives people a pathway, some insight into perhaps how to progress through their uh, career. Uh, and so, you know, again, tailor it for what makes sense for your organization. Be really clear about it. Um, but it can be exclusive because, again, mentorship is good for everyone. Uh, and so you could say something like, uh, it is open for everyone right now. This is our focus. Uh, and or you can suggest other ways that people get mentoring. You don't have to be in a formal mentorship program. People can do informal mentoring and it's just as valuable uh, as formal mentorship. And so suggest other ways that people can get connected. Right. Right. And it's good for us all to be reminded that we should seek out mentors. Absolutely. Nicole, this has been so great and there's been enormous engagement um, and you have had really valuable perspective advice. Is there one parting thought you want to leave everybody with? Oh, that's tough. I told you we have so much going on from a DNI perspective. How are we, what, do, what is the one thing we should all look ahead to in 2021? Uh, so I, I'll, I'll give you more than one. Okay. So I will say change because change always comes and will come no matter which way it, it comes for us. And to be patient. This is not a short game. This is a long-term game. And so we have to be careful, particularly as practitioners, not to overpromise things that we can't solve in six months. Things that have been problems for us, let's say we talk about racism for 400 years. Yeah. To have some patience, uh, to take care of yourself because we take on a lot in these roles as we're listening to everyone and trying to be helpful to everyone. But have patience and take care of yourself and go for some short wins. Short wins are wonderful. Go for short wins. Well, Nicole, it has just been incredible spending time with you today. Thank you for giving Thank us your you. time and your wisdom. And we look forward to talking to you again soon. You can find Nicole on LinkedIn and uh, please visit us on Fairy Godballs. And we'd love to talk to you about your diversity strategies. Thank you. Thank you, Romy.